There are very few topics in Dungeons and Dragons that are as often discussed and debated as the alignment system. In modern times, alignment is meant to serve as a barometer of a character's moral and ethical perspectives. It works well for monsters, NPCs, and player characters. Unfortunately, these days, alignment is often consigned to the justification of poor cooperative behavior for that player at the table under the dreaded guise of it's what my character would do. Now today's video isn't about resolving poor behavior based on a PC's alignment. I think that's best resolved with discussion and open communication between the players at your table. You can do it. I believe in you. No, today's video is about the curious origins of the alignment system. What we see today in most modern editions of D&D is the 3x3 three three grid, the two-way axis that pits law and chaos on one side and good and evil on the other, with neutrality playing the middleman in both cases. But that is not how the alignment system started in its beginnings. It was, in fact, a one-way factor faceted system and not how you may intuitively expect. You see the original versions of D&D featured three alignments, law, neutrality, and chaos. But why law and chaos over good and evil? Intuitively, that doesn't make a lot of sense immediately. Hi, welcome back aboard the Earthboat. I'm Randall. Today we'll talk about it and the origins of alignment in Dungeons and Dragons. When Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson were developing Dungeons and Dragons, they borrowed a lot of ideas from a lot of different sources. It's pretty evident and pervasive throughout the entire DNA fabric of D&D, but if you need a quick example, take a look at monsters. Sphinxes, minotaurs, orcs, and goblins, and so on were all cribbed from other sources, either mythology or other fantasy fiction works. It's so evident that they're inspired by a lot of the great works that came before them in the 1979 Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Dungeon Master's Guide, Gary Gygax would publish the forever famous Appendix N. Appendix N is a list of inspirational and educational reading material that helped Gary Gygax formulate the ideas that would forever be codified in Dungeons and Dragons. And it's within that list, in fact, the very beginning of that list, where we find the original tale of alignment. If you take a look at Appendix N, the first entry is Anderson, Paul Anderson. Paul Anderson isn't likely to be known by modern day fantasy fans, and I'm willing to guess the only reason you probably know Paul Anderson is if you are already an Appendix N enthusiast before watching this video. Three Hearts and Three Lions is the origin story of D&D's alignment. The book itself is kind of strange. It follows this Danish engineer known as Holger Carlsen during World War II. Holger is busy fighting Nazis when he gets shot and is suddenly transported to a parallel universe. In this parallel universe, the world is divided between law and chaos. Law is based in the human world, which is divided between the Holy Roman Empire and the Saracen. And chaos, well, chaos is the forces of the land known as the Middle World. Chaos is most notably compromised of fairies. So in this depiction of the book, it's pretty simple. Humans and humanity are the forces of law, and the monsters, including elves in this case, are the forces of chaos that seek to destroy the forces of humanity's goodly might. There is this kind of greater forces at play that are hinted at in this book, but of course they're only mostly alluded to. What we see in the story is Holger's conflict with the fairy as they are pitted on opposite sides of this struggle. The fairy are threatened by Holger and wish to stop him because they fear him becoming this great champion of law. I won't go too much deeper into the story here. It's kind of short, kind of weird, and a bit dated for modern audiences. I still found it worthwhile to read or listen to, in my case, as I listen to the audiobook. If you want to understand the origins of D&D's alignment system, because as we look at how the three-point system is presented in early versions of the game, we can start to see the parallels with the book come into play. 
if you look at the original Dungeons and Dragons game, it actually says very little about alignment at all when the first three Little Brown books were published. In the first book, it tells you it's necessary to determine what stance the character will take, law, neutrality, or chaos. It then goes on to list the types of beings that fall under the three categories, but it's surprisingly lacking in what alignment means. It supposes you understand from these fantastical fiction sources that you already have a grasp on law neutrality and chaos. It wasn't until 1981 when the Moldvay Cook basic expert set came out that we got some clarity on the three point system. Yes, it is true that Advanced Dungeons and Dragons and the Holmes basic set both came out prior to the 81 Moldvay Cook set. However, those rule sets introduced the first iterations of the two way access system that we see in modern editions. But the 1981 Moldvay Cook Basic Expert set decided to revert back to the three point system that we see in original Dungeons and Dragons. It's worth mentioning that the Moldvay Cook descriptions of law, chaos, and neutrality are focused on alignment as a guide for character behavior. They speak very little to the idea of greater cosmic forces being represented by law and chaos. From the Moldvay Cook rules, we see that lawful is described as, quote, law is the belief that everything should follow an order and that obeying the rules is a natural way of life. It goes on to list some examples of lawful behavior that creatures do, such as telling the truth, obeying laws, caring about all living creatures, and making choices to benefit the group over the individual. The section concludes with, quote, lawful behavior is usually the same behavior that could be called, quote, good. On the other hand, chaotic behavior is described as, quote, Chaos is the opposite of law. It is the belief that life is random and that chance and luck rule the world. Chaotic behaviors are described in the book as laws can be broken if you can get away with it. Telling lies and breaking promises can be useful. The self is the most important thing. Selfishness is the normal way of life. And there's a strong belief in the power of luck and this sort of random chance. The section concludes that chaotic behavior is usually the same behavior that could be called, quote, evil. Finally, we have neutrality. Quote, neutrality is the belief that the world is a balance between law and chaos. It is important neither side get too much power to upset this balance. Neutral behaviors are described as a high level of interest in personal survival, their belief in wits and ability over luck, return the treatment they receive from others, and they are willing to assist in a group if it's to their own benefit or if they can profit from it. The book concludes that neutral behavior may be considered, quote, good or, quote, evil or neither, depending on the situation. We can see from the origins there are already these weird contradictions and problems with alignment. It's kind of meant as a system of good versus evil as it's literally spelled out in the descriptions. Yet the designers seem to throw in all these ideas of order and chaos and the group and individual and so on. I'm not surprised that they later tried to extend the three point system to something greater with the nine point grid that we see in modern editions. But my issues and I suspect many other folks problems with alignment has always been the idea that it tries to classify beings too rigidly. Human beings are complex. We're capable of expressing any three of those behaviors or choices on a given day, or perhaps all three on a single day. It's why humans are listed in all three columns of the OD&D booklet table after all. Now, fantastical creatures are made up. I suppose it's possible to have all dwarves act in a certain manner. Is that fun or interesting? I don't know, perhaps. It does make them distinct to humanity as we know it on Earth, but when you have a playable race or kindred option for your players, chances are they're going to play their dwarf or elf, quite similar to a human. 
the player is human after all. It's how they think and function, so it's going to be a natural extension of their role play. The way alignment is played out in the game, I find to be too stiff. If you do something against your alignment, your alignment gets switched or you're somehow penalized if you're a cleric or a paladin. These things can feel a little bit arbitrary and DM fiat. When used in this sense, I just haven't found it to be too useful or particularly fun for myself as a game master or my players. And I'm not surprised it gets dropped in many games like my own. I think Moldvay Basic misses the mark on describing alignment. It's fine to provide some guidelines on character behavior, but ultimately I just didn't really find it that useful. Characters have nuance and make different choices at different times. Where I do think the alignment system has value, however, is the idea of cosmic forces at play. We see law and chaos represented as these grand forks in the appendix and works. The first being Paul Anderson's Three Hearts and Three Lions, but there are two other that I really like. The first being Michael Moorcock's famous multiverse. The most popular being of that multiverse is Elric of Melnibone, but of course there are other characters like Coram and Hawkmoon who are also caught up in the grand struggles of law and chaos. Secondly, I really enjoyed Roger Zelazny's Amber series. In that book series, the Court of Amber is pitted against the Courts of Chaos in their struggle to best one another. In that case, Amber represents law and then the Courts of Chaos, well, it's kind of implied, right? Courts of Chaos, it's right in the name. I think both authors are worth checking out if you want to get a better idea of these sort of cosmic forces and how they have this great struggle between one another and sort of humanity or these lower beings get caught up in this larger force that's at play. And I know that Michael Moorcock has cited Paul Anderson's Three Hearts and Three Lions as influential in his own work, so it really harkens back to this original source that Gary and Dave pull for in OD&D. Let me know in the comments if there are other books that we should check out that have to do with this sort of law and chaos cosmic force whole idea. I'm still working my way through Appendix N and more of the classical fantasy works, so I'd love to hear any recommendations you might have in the comments. Okay, so why is this idea of cosmic forces useful? Well, I think it can help with the simplification of your game worlds. When creatures are allied with law or chaos, it's easy to discern who is your party's friend and who is your party's enemy. Also, it probably helps with those hilarious alignment languages in BX. I speak the language of law. What does that even mean? I think its design purpose was to allow creatures that are aligned together to speak sort of this common tongue, but I just don't see why that's at all necessary. But it's resulted in these alignment languages appearing in the early versions of D&D. Ultimately, this probably comes down to your gaming group's preferred style of play. If you have a more lighthearted style game or a beer and pretzels game, it's nice to not get caught up in the moral quandaries of who to fight. You want to kick in some doors and fight some monsters. That's totally cool and it's a great way to play the game. And in this case, law and chaos work really well for that. If your gaming group enjoys more of the role playing opportunities and you as a game master like to present a world with 50 shades of morally gray, then maybe you don't want to use the law or chaos ideas. It's better to structure and present conflicts as a sense of each entity having their own goals and motivations. Can the party trust them or not? This does tend to slow your game down as your players now have to debate and decide which groups align with their own goals rather than using cosmic justification that all groups of law are on the same side and fighting the forces of chaos. But I do think a lot of groups find this debate and these choices satisfying, so it's a great way to play as well, and it's generally how I run my campaigns. So that's the origins of D&D's alignment system and how it was seeded from those influential fantasy fiction works. We've really only discussed the origins of alignment in this video. Obviously it has morphed beyond the three point system to the 9.3 by three grid we see in modern editions. And it's had several changes over the years. 
but I like looking at the origins of these different elements of D and D because the source materials can really offer some insight into what they were thinking and provide some glimpses into the intentions of how Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson were designing the game 50 years ago. Of course, things evolve over time and we're welcome to deviate from what their original purpose and works were. But I find if we understand why it was done one way, I think we have a better basis for making decisions to try it a different way. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like and consider subscribing. It really helps the channel out a lot. Check out Enchanted Nimbus, my monthly newsletter. Thanks for hopping aboard the Earthmo. I'll see you in the next one.